Hello and welcome to a very special Grammy edition of Titanic Talks uh, 2021 where we're going to serve up hot takes, who should have won, who got snubbed, and who just got straight up screwed over. I'm just kidding. It's an award show and uh, it's very silly, but lots of fun. Um, we lost... <laughs> Dang. You know, I'm actually more bummed out that Phoebe Bridgers got, uh, didn't win any Grammys. But I guess if you're up against Fiona Apple, that's a tough win. Almost as tough as being up against Ice T. Who's that song actually kind of slaps the one that, <laughs> the one that won? Body Count. Uh, bum rush. And if there's one thing I've learned from Will Smith, you can't stop the bum rush. Uh, that's a wild, wild west reference. Wiki wow, wiki, wiki wow, wow west. Jim West, Desperado. Did that win a Grammy? I think that may, well, I don't know. But Ice T's an OG. And, uh, you, you know, that's just, that's one of those things in life. Uh, you're not going to win a Grammy when you're up against an OG, especially when it's Ice T, man, <laughs> and whatnot. <laughs> He's super cool. Uh, it was actually pretty pretty cute. The video, I think it was his daughter. Super adorable. I actually I, I saw an interview and he was talking about winning, and uh, it was very heartwarming. So it made me happy for him. And and happy for everyone who uh, who is celebrating. That's very uh, you know, like kind of like I, I talked about in a recent video. It's weird to view music as competitive, um, but there is there is an excitement around those kind of award shows. Even though this this year it's definitely weird for any sort of award show to exist. Uh, or just kind of the way they're doing them. I, I get it. People can't be in the same room or have a mass uh, attendance. But definitely a uh, an interesting way to really end. It's almost been exactly one year to the week, I think, of, of the lockdowns. And what an appropriate way, you know, losing a Grammy, a metal Grammy to Ice-T. Uh, doesn't get any weirder than that. Um, pretty, pretty fun. And, <laughs> and pretty, pretty intriguing. I, you know, it's categorizing. It's one thing to view music as a competition but also to even to categorize it i mean it makes it easy for people to find it or put it on a playlist or on, on a radio station or something like that to me i mean it's not it just doesn't feel like a metal song to me uh but you know i guess i guess that's a, a subjective term at this point, Blue Ivy has won her first Grammy award. Uh, so there's that. Huge congratulations to Blue Ivy uh, on winning their first Grammy. Um, it's a very, very meaningful moment for Blue Ivy, I'm sure. You know, I remember back before Blue Ivy was born, I was making videos about Beyonce being pregnant many, many moons ago. And my excitement is, is still just as high for, uh, for that happening in the world. And many more Grammys to come, I'm sure. We have Harry Styles winning big over some uh, very tough competition. Harry Styles has a, uh, if I had to pick best dressed um, this year, people always tend to uh, not only take the music into consideration, 
but also what they wear uh, on nights like the Grammys. And uh, I, I think I think Harry Styles really brought the style, no pun intended. But a very very uh, very enjoyable and um, magical evening for all. Big congratulations to all the winners and and all the nominees. That's a uh, it's a feat, and not something I ever thought. Uh, something I never thought I would even be in the proximity of. It really, it seems like, I, I don't know if this is just being in Texas, but it, it seems like things are getting more back to normal. I'm sure it's a, an amalgamation of everything. But now that the vaccines are rolling out, people seem to be a little bit more comfortable being near other human beings and it's nice to feel somewhat normal i saw live music today and it was a salsa group and with salsa music you always find i was i, I couldn't i was so excited just to see any sort of live music that I, I really didn't even care what genre it was. And for the first time in my life, I actually found myself really analyzing salsa music. And that that's not easy to play. Well, I've never attempted to play it, but as I was watching the musicians who were performing... Um, they were, they were very, very talented, very good. And, uh, some of those time signatures are pretty fun. I tend to, uh, I, I never really write in, in that style or those time signatures. And, uh, it, it was a, a learning experience actually, even just enjoying the performance and everybody was dancing. I made an oath to myself to take salsa dance lessons um, because I feel like that's something in my life that <laughs> is worth doing. And it just seems like a fun time. There's a lot of elderly, um, maybe not elderly, but if I had to estimate, uh, I would probably say plus or minus five years of senior citizenship. And they were just getting down. They looked fully vaccinated, if I had to guess. And they were just loving every second of being out and cutting a rug, breaking a leg out there. And it was actually very adorable. Uh, but... Salsa is one of the, you, you can't, it, it's not like just being at a wedding and saying, ah, who cares? I'm just going to go dance. And, you know, suddenly you're getting jiggy with it. Uh, when Billy Jean hits the, uh, the DJ's MP3 player of choice. The salsa, it, it kind of, it seems, whenever you see someone dancing, salsa it's like it's their moment like no one just naturally does that you you have to I, I i mean i don't know maybe this is my whiteness talking here but there seems to be a a prerequisite there was some sort of preparation almost like you could say the same with like line dancing maybe you know you kind of have to know the line dance or be able to pick it up pretty quickly and get out there and you know show show the world who's boss with your dance moves. Um, I don't have that natural instinct, so or rhythm. So it seems as though some sort of technique uh, could be learned. 
<laughs> but they were really getting down and um it made my day it really brightened my day and it was cool because you know you, you look at your phone or you uh, read an article and it's always doom and gloom and everyone hates each other and you know you know how it is and here we were just you know having a having a nice afternoon and everyone's dancing and enjoying the music and people of all ages and sizes and ethnicities um were just everyone was just smiling and it was a really good feeling And it made my week, I have to say. Just being around people and enjoying a nice, lovely afternoon. I think it was something that I needed. And then we went to a museum, and that was probably the first museum I've been to in, well, definitely a year, but maybe a year and a half. I think the last museum I went to might have been Italy. One of the things that I think is kind of lacking post-quarantine that I'm hoping to see come back, it seems like it is, but it's the having an event to go to, a gallery opening, uh, a, a purpose to which it, usually they're on the, the weekend, like a, a purpose to like close out the week or like a having a reason to go do something. Because I think we've all kind of unintentionally and, and maybe inadvertently fallen victim to isolation. And I really, it's, that is such an overused word these days uh, but I really hope for there there was such a hoo-ha about Texas opening up and um, it's really strange to me it was strange when the the snowstorm happened and in the media at least there is this big thing of uh, just everyone kind of piling up to criticize Texans, people in Texas, uh, because the, the power grid went out. And it's like, you know, there were children uh, involved in that. And... So many factors going into a, as they say, an insurance, an act of God. And it's just kind of weird to me that um, there was a, a very quick impulse to make a snowstorm something political. I guess I get it. I mean, everyone's super bored. But that kind of thing just makes me uh, put up post-it notes around my workspace reminding me not to look on the internet. <laughs> Everyone's just real wound up. Must be a weird time to be a comedian. I mean, you can't even be silly on online anymore. You'll get in trouble. Goofing around will get you in trouble. I have to say this week I had a couple. I had I had a couple of um, creative breakthroughs this week. And I've been doing a lot of lighting tests for my next music video, which I will be shooting this week. I'm very excited about. Um, 
I'll be announcing the song uh, in a couple of days here, the title. Um, but it is very, very fun. And I released a song uh, uh, several months ago called Scorpio. And that was kind of a... I'd always written, loved writing pop songs. Drum machine, disco kind of bass lines, super catchy vocals. But I never felt confident um, releasing them as me. I would always kind of put those in a folder on a hard drive um, because I never considered myself as like a a pop artist um, with music, certainly. And I guess once I went fully solo and learned to accept like, hey, these are songs that you write, maybe put them out and perform them yourself. And uh, I, I started to really embrace the simplicity in that kind of music production, songwriting. And this new one that's about to come out was a part of a batch that I wrote around the time or the genesis of what would go on to become the second half of my new album. They were just so relentlessly fun and danceable and just exciting and and very entertaining and i wanted to put scorpio out first just because especially a couple months ago that's where i was at and how i was feeling and since then um that became one of my favorite things i've ever written and so i wrote a, a, a bunch more actually kind of in that vein And strangely enough, I mean, I never expected Scorpio to do as well as it's been doing. Um, I mean, we're coming up on a million streams on that one, which is pretty wild, actually, for me. I mean, I'm happy if 10 people (laughs) listen or watch a video um, just cause to me, it's like, oh, you think that you think this is cool? Same here. <laughs> and, um, you know, g- coming from a project that, uh, had a significant amount of eyeballs on it. To me, it was just kind of like, you know, there's always that thing. You always get like the, the trolls online, you know, it's like, oh, this is a flop. It's like, well, to you, but I had a lot of fun making it. And, you know, if, if anyone likes it, that's cool because, you know, it's, I just write stuff and put it out there so it's archived online, you know, I guess for me. And the things that I've released, even though I've got hundreds and hundreds of songs on hard drives, um, the ones that I put out are the ones, like publicly, are the ones that feel like definitive. And um, it's cool when, I mean, that's that's the power of Spotify. I mean, Scorpio just got put on a couple pretty big playlists and then... It just took off. I, you know, that's something like running my own label. Like, it's literally, at least on the label side, it's just me. And um, sometimes things just have a life of their own. You know, you can promote stuff and advertise and stuff. I've never done it ever. 
I just set it and forget it. And, um, and that's something I could probably get better at. I think if I took it more seriously, but I think maybe that's kind of the, um, Midwest indie rocker in me that wants it kind of to happen organically. And I think that that's something that you can kind of disguise with high quality photos and good looking videos and stuff, make it look like there's a whole operation behind it. But in my experience, I mean, the biggest stuff I've ever been a part of, you know, it all just, that, that's something, you know, there's this assumption that like once, once you sign like a big record deal or you get on a label, like there's going to be all of these people who just make it happen for you. And that's just not the case. You know, it's most of the time, or at least in, in my experience, you know, someone gets signed to a label and these people who work at the labels, they're, they always jump around. It's like any other business. They get a better offer for a higher salary or a better position or whatever it is. And then suddenly the person who made the decision to bring you on and give you a push, then they're gone and you're just kind of like left with whoever. And that, that might be someone who passed on you or your songs or your vision or whatever it is. Uh, that happens a lot. And so when I made the decision to fully go 100% solo, that was highly influenced by having done so much on my own over the course of, you know, several years um, and realizing like, oh, you know, if you want to get something done right, you just, you got to do it yourself. And if, if you find people along the way who can help, I mean, that's just a blessing. And I wish there was more conversation about that. Um, at least on like YouTube or longer form videos like this, because I, I haven't seen a lot of it where people really talk about the ins and outs. But I think there's that thing where um, people who are, are either in the music realm, entertainment, I guess, in general, you know, there's that fear of saying the wrong thing and, you know, people don't want to upset the powers that may be. And I can't, I can't, uh, I can't hate on that because there's, look, if they, if they want to make you happen, they can make you happen. Um, but I mean, the second anything goes wrong, you know, uh, done. So that's, it's curtains. <laughs> and I have a, fair amount to say about that it's it's the weirdest when you've got the um the people who are on your side and they're like you know hey we know what happened you know they they see it for what it's worth but it's that outside it's it's the perception you know like oh yeah but you know which That's been, that's been a lot. Working under pseudonames. That's kind of a tough pill to swallow. I think you'd be surprised the songs that I've written for other people. But I, I think I, I, I would probably estimate that that's, been one of those things that help um, dissolve the ego even more because it's one thing when your name you know your or your pseudonym 
is all over the place and people are excited and there's articles being written about you and this and that. But that just, that just, if you're on the quest to better yourself as far as ridding the ego, um, that's probably the last thing in the world that you need. But when there's a political structure and, and especially like the, the climate of everything, um, so you really have to have a conversation with yourself, you know, it's like, well, is it worth it to fight, um, to fight the system and prevent the song from coming out or the video from coming out or whatever it is? Cause for the longest time I would, uh, I mean, that's how I came up with Titanic Sinclair. I was just, I was working on things I was embarrassed of. And I thought, well, if I just come up with the most outrageous name, like pseudo name or pen name, um, at least it'll be obvious. Like that's not a real name. And then I could use that as a vehicle to not take credit for things that like had to be credited and it just, it just, it stuck and then it became funny to me. And then I realized like, uh, it's pretty easy to Google and it's that classic thing where, you know, the band who has a horrible band name and it just, it stuck and for the rest of their careers they're known as that i don't i don't really feel that way i think i think it's funny but looking back you know the the initial impulse of having a ridiculous name to put on things i was embarrassed by and now that name though I'm doing plenty of work for other people, you know, it's like, well, we can't use that name though. So come up with another one. <laughs> and, um, it's just weird because there's a lot of that, you know, Dr. Luke, like he went through his, his, uh, cancellations. I think there was maybe more. I don't know. I can't keep up with them all anymore. Um, he's still <laughs> producing like everything. And I think maybe they're putting his name on stuff again, but I remember there was a moment where I was just like, let's, let's have him do it. But let's just, you know, say it was some other name. Like I know that feel. But then the, the, on a similar level, you know, this is something I don't think I've ever talked about ever, you know, most of the things I've ever created, um, I've never even talked about probably things that more people have seen actually, because a big part of my life for the past, you know, probably 12 or 13 years is like television development. Um, you know, the pitching process for TV shows. That was, that was my first job in California, at least in Los Angeles. And, um, I met some great people, you know, very well-respected television producers. And that was my, you know, they, they say that, um, or I've heard people say that the equivalent in Los Angeles to busing tables is editing reality TV. <laughs> and that, that was what I was doing when I first moved. I just, I, I had to make some money and I'm pretty well versed in editing. And at the time I'm like a 26 year old or something like that, 25 or 26. But there's, there's so much behind the scenes stuff especially in kind of the realm that I've been in where there, I just, 
there was always so much secrecy and, you know, the people I worked with, you know, they wanted that as well. I, I would say that's something that we kind of really saw eye to eye on because it's like, especially at the time, it's like real life is just so boring. If people only knew how boring everyone is, but you sell the illusion of it being larger than life and it's that whole kind of Instagram model of, you know, if you're on the private plane, you got to post a photo of it. But if you're flying back in coach, post a photo out the window just to, to still show that you're flying, but you're not showing that you're with everyone else. <laughs> and after a while, that just becomes so absurd because it's like, you know, everyone, everyone goes to the bathroom. Like, it's not pretty. That's why it's so funny when you hear about, like, dictators and they're like, oh, they, like, <laughs> they don't even go to the bathroom. It's like, okay. <laughs> That's a level beyond kind of, like, the silliness I've been involved in. But if I could go back, I, w I would have been doing stuff like this so long ago. I mean, obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh It certainly would have saved me from a lot of uh a lot of hassle i think um to show the 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 reality of what it's actually like to do that kind of thing Because years later now, it still is, it can be very perplexing. And not, not so much for me, because it's like, I, I've, heard, I've heard it all. I mean, years ago, I had heard it all. I mean, the, you play with fire, you get burnt. And the way it, the, the evolution of, um, how I would ultimately get burned the worst, I, I actually didn't see coming. I was like, oh, there's no way they're going to, like, go that nuclear. But, you know, the, the court of public opinion is... Uh, Seems to be whoever strikes first, people believe. And, um, I've learned from that. And I think maybe that's why I never, like, in my life, whenever something like big was going down, you know, first of all, something you've got to realize, like, there's an entire team of people and some of the best attorneys in the world telling you, shut up and go away. Let this blow over. And it's like, yeah, I, for back before the internet, I guess <laughs> that would work. Cause my initial impulse always when something goes down is like, uh, I can easily prove this wrong right now. And, but then you get all these people telling you like, yeah, but you're just going to look, guilty no matter what and and people you know even if you prove it their 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 decisions made up already and uh there's so many different levels of the psychology of that you know when it's happening to you and you know you know, you have on your phone, like if people just saw, but even in that case, it, there's still, you know, for the most part, uh, they don't care, which is fine. That's, that's their prerogative. And I think even I've been guilty of that. 
you know, some artist that you love or, or you know, some someone you admire and then you see like, oh, damn, something like they did some, you know, bad stuff, you know, because mo- most of these, most of the cancellations, it's, I mean, for the most part, it's like, it's to the point now literally where it's just like, oh, this person like wasn't, was a jerk, you know, did something mean but they're getting treated and I understand there's exceptions like, you know, I, I try to not pay attention to it. I I saw one, some streamer person, uh, like a week ago maybe. And it was like, Oh God, like, (laughs) okay, this is okay. I, yes. And I mean, I, I, I'm just talking about it here. I I know I'm not going to change any minds. And that's not my, trust me, I know. If your mind's made up, I am not going to be the one to change it. You know, we're running out of people to cancel. And there haven't really been any prime examples of how to remedy that. Because it seems to me that the the way everything works now, there's just too much incentive to propagate hate. To quote Will Smith again, hate in your harp will consume you too. That was just the two of us, not Wild Wild West. Uh, But an equally, I think three times now, um, I've referenced Will Smith in this. But that's true. And, um, you know, someone, someone asked me about, um, my favorite parable, uh, and it was in a comment, I think it might have been in one of the member videos, but they were, they asked my favorite parable and I was, you know, It's like, I don't know if I have a favorite, but the parable of the Good Samaritan hit me the hardest. Um, And I kind of wanted to dive into that a little bit more because it really ties into that that quote from a Will Smith song. (laughs) But I think he's right. Hate, Hate in your heart will consume you too. And the way that ties into the Good Samaritan, you know, it's like, I think the hardest thing in my life I've ever done is to truly forgive people who wronged me. I've had some life altering situations being wronged. I've had the situations too, by the way, where it's like, ah, yeah, I deserved it. Like, yeah, I, I was, I was a dumb dumb. But um, really, it's it's the big ones, you know. It's the, it's for me at least. It's like the ones that you know a lot of people think about me, and you know, it's like, well, it took me a long time to be like, hey. You got to remove yourself from this. How would you feel if you just, you know, read what was said about you and took it all as 100% truth? Like, yeah, I'd I'd probably really not like me. But it's impossible to, you know, when you were there and lived through it, and giant, giant career shattering gaps are conveniently left out. Um, it, it's it's hard to be fully understanding of 
observing it as an outside observer. But we don't live in a time of nuance. Um, and that's a big part of why I, I love this format where it's just <laughs> hours of just talking because it's like, well, if you're interested at all in getting past the headline, um, I think this is a great format because I'd be really interested to hear, you know, some of the more higher profile um, controversies. I think it's always good to hear all sides. You know, there's three sides to every story. And uh, it's their side, their side, and your side. I think where I'm at with all of it now, you know, I'm really trying my hardest to implement that Good Samaritan parable. Because that's for me, you know? It's like, hey, you know what? I forgive you. Even though every ounce of me says to fight <laughs> and prove whatever I feel needs to be proven. But in the grand scheme, you know what? I forgive you. And I love you. And I wish you the best. Not in a snarky way. Like. Spiritual forgiveness. Been working hard on that, man. It's just not been easy for me. But the more time that passes, the more relief and understanding. Because it really is. You know, if you're if you're holding on to that hate, and I was, just letting it fester, letting it keep me up at night, letting it boil my blood, and then I came across that parable, and it was just like, you know what? Hmm. It can be gone because I think if I were to not wake up in the morning for whatever reason. Whew. I wouldn't want this to all end um, over something so small. Over money. And I'm not going to get into details of any of the controversies I've been in. But in general, money. Call me simple, but if you have an agreement, honor it. Because the people who really, the people that lose are the fans. You know, you go through media spectacles and I've talked to some very well-known but very smart people about it and I remember once we were like at dinner and I was just kind of having an existential crisis you know and it's like who wins and my friend just goes the attorneys <laughs> and it's true And who loses? The fan. Because I, I, was, I was that kid growing up that was just 
I would obsess over my favorite bands and the mythology and all of it. And I remember just thinking like, oh man, like why can't they just do one more record? Probably because of probably because of a legality. I never thought I'd be in that situation. Shows how naive I was. You know, like, I used to think you could just talk anything out, you know, and if at least get, get down to like the core of it, you know, and it's like, first of all, if I, if I wronged you, like, let's, let's talk about it and get to a point where there's an understanding and, but it seems like a lot of the time, um, You don't know. And no one around you knows until suddenly it's a headline. But that's kind of the strike first mentality. Because then you're so stunned, like, whoa, what? <laughs> what's going on? And usually it's something that was like calculated and nobody wins. <laughs> Maybe that should be the uh, title of this video. <laughs> it's a little bit clickbaity. Nobody wins. The way you win is with your day to day life. I was talking to a friend actually who um, I haven't talked to since high school. And I'm a grandpa now. So um, that was like 32,000 years ago. And um, it was so cool to hear from him. And uh, very, very smart dude. And he's doing really well for himself. But he's one of those guys that's like, oh, you want everyone knew he was going to do really cool stuff and super hard worker and handsome, you know, <laughs> um, super funny. And I thought it was so nice f that he reached out and, um, and he was asking, we, we actually, we made a short film when we were in high school that he wrote and it was really ahead of its time actually. And he was just asking if I had the footage. And he's like, you know, I, I, I'm I, sure this is just like a shot in the dark. But I was like, actually, no, I think I do have the footage. I don't know if I have an edit, but I'm pretty sure I have the footage. And um, anyway, we got to talking, you know, just kind of catching up. And he was saying how cool he thought it was with what I've been up to and, but I was saying how cool I, I thought, you know, you know, he's like, you're living the dream. I was like, ah, dude, you've got a family, you know, you have a, a baby and a wife. That's the dream. And we got into the whole, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side kind of thing, but That was something I pushed away for so long when I was just consumed with things like the Grammys. I always felt, this is why I, I never really got into sports because my philosophy was always like, someone's going to win next time. You know, the Super Bowl, it's just like this big thing. It's like, yeah, someone's going to win next year. And maybe that's the wrong way of looking at it but and that's not to say that there's not um room for healthy competition i i just felt like in the times that i found myself to be competitive 
It just wasn't a good look. I really did want Griotti to win, though. Because there were several times in those sessions where I remember thinking, like, we're doing something special here. But what he did for that album, that was award-winning. And you can tell when, you can tell really, anytime you're around greatness, um, you can tell when someone's swinging for a grand slam or a home run or, you know, they're playing to win. And in those sessions, for that album at least, I was just starting to get exhausted. Which you could argue that that enabled me to like kind of get into a flow state and just create. And so every day I'd have a new demo to bring in and be like, okay, at least we have a starting point. Because there's nothing worse in a session when you're just kind of everyone's sitting around twiddling their thumbs. So, and I'd been through enough of those sessions to be like, all right, well, we're all on the same page. I can bring, I can bring my A game. And it just so happened around that time I was, I was really starting to, I think, get pretty good at, um, songwriting good times though and all jokes aside and uh in all seriousness like i would like to publicly go on the record and Just say how much I enjoyed making that music. And how I wish that the, um, the indus, the suits wouldn't have, um, ripped it apart. And maybe at some point, because uh, they're all in it still, you know. And um, no one wants to, like, rock the boat. But I'm out. <laughs> I've been out for a while. Um, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um and say that that was some of the best times of my life. And that I fully believe that um, maybe, maybe in the future, maybe 20, 30 years in the future, someone else uh, who was there will address what the problem was. That led, that led our, um, I think what I would consider the greatness that we achieved to be dismantled. And it was the suits. The people who work for them wanted more money. And that's what happens, you know? Never thought it would happen to what we were doing. But what are you going to do, you know? All good things have endings. And I will continue to 
write songs that you can at least understand what is being said. This would be a good time to cue uh, You Can't Always Get What You Want by Rolling Stones. I always love that, that point in the movie where the music cue just hits right. But I'm happy for iced tea. <laughs> and body count. And I think I'm going to go um, do a proper headphone listen of all the songs that... Um, there's no way you could listen to all of it. Uh, well, someone I'm sure has, but so many categories, um, which I just learned today, um, how many of them exist. Um, and I think I kind of realized the, uh, the lack of familiarity I had with even so many genres. I'm going to make a special announcement video for the winner of the bass guitar strings. Yeah, I'll have to pick this up. Uh, next time. Well, thank you for watching.